Hello and welcome to today's video. My name is Anakin. I design knitting patterns. I teach knitting workshops online and in person and I sell yarn through my website yarnaddict.co.uk. You can find all my links below this video. If you like this video please give it a thumbs up and if you haven't subscribed yet please consider subscribing and leave me a comment. Ask any questions you have or leave any comments if you have any observations or contributions to make please leave them below. I love reading your comments. So today's video is about yarn substitution. So I think yarn substitution is a topic that intimidates quite a lot of knitters. Um, I am spe speaking specifically about knitting today but this obviously can apply to crochet as well. A lot of what I'm going to talk about applies to crochet as well as knitting but because I'm primarily a knitter although I do crochet and I have designed crochet patterns in the past I am primarily a knitter so I'm talking about it more from a knitting point of view. Um, I'm going to mostly be talking about uh, yarn substitutions, substitutions in the terms of knitting garments Obviously, this can apply to anything you knit. Uh, accessories, shawls, scarves, hats, socks, hand warmers, cowls. Oh, and before anyone asks, because I've shown my hands in the video now, these are not hand knitted. Um, they just arrived and my hands were a bit cold, so I put them on and I just love the colour. These are from a company called, I think they're called the Cozy Bear Company. Uh, most of my um, cashmere hand warmers are from a company called Turtle Doves. But a few months ago, this company called the Cozy Bear Company popped up on my Instagram stories as an ad. And I clicked on it just to check it out. And they had a sale on or discount on. So I ordered a pair and um, then this week I ordered another pair. Um, and I do like this colour. They are identical to my Turtle Doves hand warmers. Uh, except the turtle dove ones have a label on that says turtle doves but otherwise i would say they're identical but i've given a couple of my hand warmers to my husband recently a couple of my more neutral colored ones so i decided to treat myself to another pair so if you're wondering what this is this is what i'm wearing it's not hand knitted i've been asked before when i wear uh, cashmere hand warmers if they're hand knitted i will try and leave remember to leave the link to both the cozy bear company and turtle doves below this video video because i can highly recommend them both and this is not sponsored i bought this with my own money but if turtle loves all the cozy bear company want to sponsor me then do let me know i'm open to sponsorship because i love these hand warmers and i wear them every single day in the winter anyway i'm not about here to talk about my cold hands and my cashmere hand warmers um we're going to talk about yarn substitutions so i'm mainly going to talk about it i think i was saying i'm mainly going to talk about it in terms of garments but this obviously applies to other things as well and we're going to consider four well three main things um and some of them may not be what you immediately think about when you think about substituting yarn so the first thing i want to con um, comment on is uh fiber content and i think this is quite often missed when we talk about yarn substitution so in the past i know i've said to people try and choose a yarn that has similar um, fiber content that would be kind of my starting point so if the pattern you want to knit uses 100% wool try and find a yarn that is 100% wool having said that sometimes you may want to use a different yarn for a particular reason you may be too sensitive to wool you may only be able to tolerate certain wool types like I can wear merino and blue face Leicester but some of the hardier wools I'm quite sensitive to, whereas I have members of my family who can't wear any wool at all, even just one well, of my daughters, or both my daughters maybe, uh, just ask them to put on a sweater to model for me, <laughs> will sometimes have them going, oh, it's itchy, and it's like super fine merino. Um, my mum's also very sensitive to wool, uh, and I also know people who are very sensitive to alpaca and mohair, especially the hairier alpaca, the surrey alpaca. So people have different sensitivities. There may also be other reasons why you choose to work with certain fibres or choose not to work with certain fibres. Some people have very strong views about whether something should be superwash treated or not. Uh, some people have very strong views about uh, natural fibres versus uh, artificial or man-made fibres. Um, some people may not want to use certain fibres because that come from certain animals because they think the animals are mistreated i'm not going to go into all those reasons because it's a bit of a minefield but there may be certain reasons why you want to use certain fibers or want to avoid certain fibers however you need to think about what properties uh, the fiber brings to the design so for example 
uh, my mum wanted to knit a sweater a couple of years ago when I was in Norway and I think the yarn used in the pattern was wool and I said well do you really want to knit it in wool because you don't like wearing wool <laughs> you always say it's too itchy so I said do you really want to knit it in wool so she actually chose cotton I think it might have been cotton merino but I think it was cotton 100% cotton but she was also knitting a colour work fabric uh, pattern so the sweater which had like a colour work strand of colour work on the yoke so I then said well remember cotton won't knit up as evenly or look as even in colour work as wool will um so wool for example will kind of even itself out so if you knit wool and it looks a bit uneven if you block it or steam it and give it a bit of a pull in all directions the stitches will kind of even themselves out and make up for any gaps if you like um that may not happen to other fibers for example cotton doesn't tend to do that wool has memory and tends to want to return to its original shape and it makes it more elastic than other fibers uh, wool is also self-cleaning uh, so it doesn't need to be washed as often as maybe other fibers do and it stays warm even after it's wet so if you're wearing a wool sweater and you get wet you will still you won't feel as cold as if you're wearing a cotton sweater that got wet um, so for example if you're wearing wool socks on your feet in walking boots and you're walking across the moors and it's raining and muddy and you get very wet feet the wool will still help your feet to stay warm even though it's wet so wool does have some very specific properties other fibers have other properties some fibers are more cooling so if you live in a hot climate or a country where it's hot more than it's cold knitting something in wool might not be ideal because you might not get to wear it often enough if you live somewhere if you're lucky enough to live somewhere where it's only cold a couple of months of the year why would you knit a thick wool sweater because you might not get to wear it so you might want to use a fiber choose a fiber that is um more suitable to your um climate so those are things you want to bear in mind um plant fibers like cotton and bamboo tend to be heavier than animal fibers um, although in my experience I think uh, a packet feels heavier than wool sometimes I think maybe it depends on how it's spun so for example if you knit a cable sweater in uh, cotton it will look very different to a cable sweater knitted in wool it's likely to be heavier and stretch more than a cable sweater knit, knitted in wool shorter animal fibers tend to be softer than longer animal fibers so for example if you look at all the sheep's wools the softest ones tend to have the ones that have the shorter fiber length or what we call staple um they tend to be softer than the wools with the longest staple and cashmere which is incredibly soft uh, has a very short um fiber staple so while since i've spun cashmere so i'm not sure how short it is but trying to spin pure cashmere is quite challenging if you are a novice uh, spinner so you do need to think about the properties of the fiber you're using cashmere for example is very very warm so you might not want to knit a thick cashmere sweater you might want to knit a thinner one because a thick one is probably going to be too cold unless you live somewhere very very cold or you're a very cold person so you do need to take the fiber content and the properties of that fiber content into consideration so reading up about different uh, the properties of different fibers is a good idea and time well spent you can also learn that from like um, knitting with different fiber contents and see how the yarn react but if you want to knit a sweater that's for example uh, knitted in 100% wool and you choose 100% cotton and it doesn't come out looking like the pattern that might just be because you've chosen the wrong fiber for that sweater so it is a good idea to learn by fiber content and the effect that has on the pattern you're knitting uh, before you make costly mistakes another thing you need to consider, consider is how is the yarn spun so is it a singles yarn or an unspun yarn which is very popular at the moment so it's what um hand spinners would call pencil roving <laughs> it's basically like a thicker yarn it tends to be thicker yarn that's unspun um i think some of the uh, i think some of the icelandic yarns the lopi yarns are a bit like that but i've never actually um use the lopi yarn so i may be talking rubbish there but i've seen quite a few people on instagram knitting these sweaters in quite thick um chunky um unspun wool 
And the problem with that, and also with uh, single ply yarns that are thinner, is that they tend to break easier. So once you've knitted them up, they'll be fine. They're not going to fall apart. At least I don't think so. But if you have any different experience, do share them below. But as you're knitting with them, if you pull on it, it's more likely to break because what makes the fibers hold together is the twist. So when you spin the yarn, you add twist to the fiber and that is what makes the fiber hold together. So if the fiber has less twist, it's more likely to fall apart. So loosely spun yarn or an unspun yarn or a single, singles yarn does have some twist in it. So for example, this is uh, Manos of Uruguay Fino and I'm thinking about using that in the design so it's lying right in front of me and this is an unspun yarn uh, sorry it's not an unspun yarn it's a singles yarn and that means that it just has a single strand of yarn it doesn't have several plies spun together so most yarns are multi-ply yarns I'm just looking I did have several balls of yarn on my desk but I think I tidied them away just before starting this video let's try and separate this yarn More difficult to separate than I thought it would be. I need an extra hand really. This is a yarn that is um, higher twist. So it's a sock yarn, but it has extra twist added to it. So I managed to separate this. So if I pull the plies apart, I can see that this yarn consists of two strands plied together. And this happens to be a yarn that has quite a high twist. So it has more twist per inch than... Um, most yarns have um, and that makes it more hard wearing so a yarn that has more a higher twist more twist per inch or per centimeters than most yarn than other yarns is harder wearing and with sock yarns like this you can normally tell that by the number of meters per 100 grams so a lot of sock yarns for example has around 400 meters per 100 grams this has i think from memory about 360 365 I don't have the label. Oh, yes, I do have the label here. Is this the label? Yes, so it's uh, Flamingo. It's Twisted Sock from Spectrum Fibre. And it is 365 metres. So it has um, fewer metres than a lot of sock yarns, which are around 400, 420 metres per 100 gram. So you need to bear in mind the twist it has, how many plies are spun together, if more plies are spun together, the yarn tends to be what we call rounder and bouncier. So it tends to look more even than a yarn which only has a couple of plies spun together. You need to think about, is it an unspun yarn? Is it a plied yarn? And how many plies does it have spun together? If you want to knit things like colour work and cables, I think it's best to use a yarn that has more plies spun together because it tends to be more even and look better especially in things like cables normally for lace knitting yarns which only have two plies tend to be recommended because that's supposed to make the yarn overs open up more um i've knitted lace in all kinds of yarns i've also knitted color work in two ply yarns i mean i talk about two ply i don't talk about the thickness of yarn but the how many plies are spun together and that is the other thing, a little, little bit of a side note here, it's quite confusing the way yarns are categorised. So in the UK we have 2-ply, 4-ply, DK, Aran and Chunky. In the US it's, um, lay, I don't know whether lace is officially a category, uh, fingering weight, sports weight, worsted weight, chunk bulky I think. Um, I think in Australia they use ply, so 2-ply, 4-ply, 6-ply, 8-ply, I think 8-ply is about a DK and so forth. So it's confusing. In the States they have a system where they number the yarn. So the thinnest yarn is zero and then it goes up. And I had to use that system when I wrote my books to categorise the yarns I was using. So a lot of yarn companies, if you buy an American yarn, you will see that number on the label. But it hasn't really spread. I guess maybe it was a way of trying to... Um, standardized yarn weights more but it hasn't really worked so the best way to work out and it's, and in some countries they don't give the yarn kind of like a weight category at all in Norway they don't talk about the answer DK or four plus so you need to just look at the label and see how many meters it has so for example if you want a yarn that has 200 meters per 50 grams that's 400 meters per 100 grams that's about a four ply sock yarn weight um 
fingering weight is often considered to be about the same as the four ply weight but it's not exactly the same some people say that the sports weight or worsted weight is the same as dk whereas dk is really between sports weight and worsted weight so it is difficult so the best thing is to um look at the yarn weight um, the best thing is to look at the number of meters of yards per uh, skein size and then take it from there i'll talk a little bit more about that later on we'll get back to how the yarn is spun because i'm kind of going off on a bit of a tangent here plies usually means that the yarn has more even better stitch definition um yarn and yarns with a higher twist are more suitable to hard wearing garments so for example that's why some sock yarns have a higher twist so that they're more hard wearing because things that are worn on your feet tend to wear out more so it is important to consider how the yarn is spun what i haven't touched on is worse than spun compared to woolen spun so woolen spun is where you take the fibers the raw fibers before you spin them and you card them and the fibers are kind of crisscrossed each other so you have fibers lying that way that way that way and they're all bungled up together mixed up together and when you spin that you get a loftier uh, lighter yarn um that has a lot more air trapped in it so it's a warmer yarn but it's lighter and um yeah a lot warmer than than a woolen than a worsted spun yarn worsted spun yarn which i think is probably the most common for yarn uh, for hand knitting yarn is where you comb the fibers and all the fibers are lying in the same direction so if you imagine combing your hair imagine you get out of bed and your hair is like a bright mess like a bird's nest it's just all directions and then you comb it and it ends up all nice and smooth like this with all the strands of yarn uh, all the strands of yarn all the strands of hair lying in the same direction that is what woolen uh, worse than spun yarn mixing up my terms this morning so if you imagine your hair combed like this all nice and smooth i overdid the amount of serum in my hair this morning so it actually looks slightly greasy but it's not i just put too much serum in um so this would be woolen no this would be worse than spun yarn so this would be worse than spun yarn but all the fibers are lying in the same direction and that creates a smoother yarn tends to be a bit shinier uh, because it has a smooth even surface and it um it's probably the way most knitting yarns are spun i think i think there are some companies that spin woolen spun yarn but worse than spun yarn tend to be a little bit heavier not as light and airy as woolen spun yarns and then there are other things you need to consider for example this yarn which is sedici i think it's called from adria feel I think that's an italian yeah made in italy so that's an italian brand i got this at a yarn shop i was teaching at recently and let me see if i can pull the end out here um i haven't quite decided what i'm going to knit with it yet but i have ideas so let me just see if i can pull one of these strands out so this is actually a knitted tube can you see that how that's like a knitted tube so it would be like guess it would be the equivalent of like a very fine eye cord so an eye cord is when you knit a tube on just about, usually about three stitches i think this would be like the equivalent of that but obviously it's done on a machine and it's very very light so with this it's a very very light knitted tube it's quite elastic and i would imagine this is very warm and knitted up it's very very light um it has 260 meters per 50 grams um so which would normally be the equivalent of about a thin four ply i would say very thin four ply but this looks a lot thicker than a four ply so if i compare it to this yarn which is a sock yarn sock yarns i would say are a little bit thinner than a four ply but if you look at the difference in thickness there can you see that it's a big difference in thickness and this yarn has 365 meters per 100 grams and this has um 260 meters per 50 grams that's 400 no 520 meters per 100 grams so it's a lot more yarn per 100 gram than a sock yarn even though the yarn's a lot thicker and that's because it's very very light it just feels very light and airy i think i'm going to do like an accessory in it but i'm not quite sure yet this yarn um which looks even this looks thinner let me see if i can show you that I cannot show you this so even this 
this also looks a lot thinner hang on you see that this is a uh, color lab dk from west yorkshire spinners so this is a dk yarn and it has 225 meters per 100 grams so this has twice as much meterage per 100 grams whereas this looks thicker so um these kind of yarns i don't quite know what you call these chain net yarns i'm not quite sure what they're called really they're not very common um and they are very very warm i probably would not knit a garment in it because i think that would be too warm for me i don't really like wearing anything much thicker than four ply maybe dk but certainly I would not knit myself an iron weight sweater because it would just be too thick for me. Um, so how? So if you're knitting a garment that's knitted in this and you substitute it for something like that, um, this garment knit in this is going to feel heavier than that just because this is such a light yarn. Um, so how the yarn is spun and plied and the fibre content is very, very important. The most important thing when it comes to substituting yarns is to check your tension so the pattern will tell you what the tension of the pattern is or what tension the pattern should be knitted to and you have to make sure that you get the same tension so if you choose a yarn that you think will work your last step is to um, knit a tension square and check that you get the correct tension if you don't on the needles the pattern recommends then you try a different needle size and you try again and you keep doing that and if you try two or three needle sizes and you can't get the right tension then maybe that's not the right yarn this ball bands has the tension listed on it so it normally has a square like that and then it has 22 stitches at the bottom and 28 rows and it says tension 10 centimeters four inch square 28 rows 22 stitches most patterns have some kind something like that written on it uh some um Yarns like this one that's the Uruguay Fino has a uh, gauge 22, no, hang on, try that again. Gauge 24 to 28 stitches equals 4 inch 10 centimeters. Needles US 3 to 5, 3 to 3.75 millimeter. So this gives you a range of tension and a range of needle sizes. So the way I use the tension that's stated on the ball band is if I wanted to knit something in this. Uh, or if the pattern was knitted in this, but I want to use something different because I lived in a country where you can't get West Yorkshire spinners. It's a British yarn. I don't know whether it's available uh, in other countries. So say, for example, I had designed a pattern using this and my mum in Norway wanted to knit it, but she can't get this yarn in Norway. The first thing I would say is to look at the um, fibre content look at the number of meters per skein size so this is 100 grams 225 meters so the first thing i would do would be to look for a wool yarn that has approximately 225 meters per 100 gram then i would look at the tension on this ball um this um ball band and look at the tension on the yarn i want to use and see if they're roughly the same so if this has 22 stitches and i choose a yarn that ha also has 22 stitches and hopefully they will knit up about the same and then i would um, knit a tension square to make sure that my tension matches that of the pattern so that's how i would approach it i would look for a yarn that has a similar number of meters per 50 or 100 grams and the tension on the ball bands are roughly the same and then i would knit a tension square to make sure that i get the same tension as listed in the pattern so i don't have to get the correct tension that's listed on the ball band i need to look at the tension that's knitted in the pattern for my tension square because that's the tension i need to match when i design something i design a garment to my tension because i knit the tension square so for example tomorrow i have to write a pattern i had the ten oh there you go i was gonna say i just had the tension square here and it's going to be knitted in garter stitch so I've knitted a tension square in garter stitch and I'm going to measure that later and work out what my tension is. My sample knitter then has to check to make sure that she gets the same tension. If she doesn't, I will rewrite the pattern. I'll just rerun the maths through my spreadsheet and write a pattern in her tension. Um, I haven't even looked to see what it says on the ball band for that yarn. Have I got the ball band here? Oh, there it is. So that is knitted in... Rowan, some light four ply, and the tension on here. Oh, that's tiny. I can't even read that. 
28 stitches, 36 rows. But that's in stocking stitch. So the tension on the ball band is usually in stocking stitch. I'm knitting in garter stitch, so that's going to be different anyway. So the tension on the ball band is just a guide and it's really useful to look at when it comes to um, substituting yarn and finding a yarn that you think will knit to that similar tension. And then finally, you've got to think about yarn amount. So will you have the right amount of yarn? So if the pattern says it takes 500 grams DK yarn and you work out everything else, you think about everything else and you think, right, I need 500 grams, you buy 500 grams of DK yarn. Your yarn that you've chosen may knit to the same tension. You may match the tension in the pattern, but it may have a sim different amount of meterage. So if this yarn, for example, this Colour Lab DK has 225 meters, I'm going to get just get my calculator out. If I choose a yarn that has 200 meters per 100 grams, so 225 times 5 for 500 grams is 1125. I can just write that down because I will forget. 1125. If I choose a yarn that has 200 meters, but it knits to the same tension, so when I knit it up, I get the correct tension. 200 meters times 5. That's a thousand meters. So that's 125 meters less than the color lab. So I might be okay because most designers will allow a little bit of a safety margin in there. Usually that means that we'll round up to the next ball size. So if it takes 225 grams, you might round up to 250 grams. Or if a yarn that just comes in whole um, 100 gram balls, so if I was designing something in this and the sample or I calculated that size would take 225 grams, I would put three balls because two balls wouldn't be enough. So if the pattern takes 430 grams in my size, it would actually say five balls on the thing, on the pattern. Um, so then if I buy five, even if it has a little bit less per um, few meters per ball size, I should still be okay. But obviously you may not know that because the designer might not put the actual amount used. Sometimes they might just round it up. So most designers will knit the sample size. So for example, if I design for magazines, I will knit the sample size and then I will weigh that and then I will check that against my calculations. I have a spreadsheet sheet that cal calculates the yarn amount I need to use or that I will need for that pattern. And I will compare what I get for size 10 to the sample size I'm knitted, which is usually size 10. And then I will just use that to kind of work out the other sizes. Um, Self-published patterns, some designers get every single size test knitted, some don't. Uh, if you have a test knitted, then obviously the test knitter can tell you how much they used. Uh, but a lot of uh, patterns don't get test knitted, they just get tech edited, which is, I'm not going to get into the whole thing, tech editing versus test knitting. But, uh, um, or they may get some sizes test knitted, but not all of them. So you may not know exactly. And if I calculate a size to use 450 grams and the yarn comes in 500 gram uh, in 100 gram balls i'm going to put 500 grams of five balls rather than four and a half or 4.3 because i just want to have, allow a little bit of safety margin there um so the knitter has a little bit more yarn to play with um but do check that you've got a knife yarn so if you buy a yarn and the Yarn company says, says, and I've seen this, this knits the standard DK tension and you think, okay, so DK yarn, I'll just buy another DK yarn and the same amount of balls that you had. So it says 500 gram balls in DK, I'll buy 500 gram balls in DK of this other yarn. That should be fine. It may not be. Uh, so just follow the guides I've given you in this video and hopefully you should be okay. Um, if you have substituted yarns, if you regularly substitute yarns, let me know. Uh, what is your experience? Have you failed? Have you normally been successful? Do you avoid substituting yarns because you are worried about making a mistake and completely failing? Uh, also, let me know. Let me know your experience of experiences of yarn substitutions. Okay, that's enough for this video. It's a little bit longer than what I tended it to be. I am quite chatty. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you liked it, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any questions, please ask below or leave me any comments you have. And if you like this video, uh, please subscribe. <laughs>
and uh, I post videos regularly here on YouTube. I do my podcasts, uh, knit and chat videos, tutorials, product and yarn reviews, all kinds of stuff. If there's anything particularly you want me to talk about, leave me a comment below this video as well and I will add it to my list. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.